Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 786 for February 3rd, 2024. And I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Bart Bouchats with another installment of Programming by Stealth. Hello, Bart. Well, hello there. Well, I've got a big thing to interrupt the show with before we even get a chance to get started. Uh, just a few hours ago, Helma Vanderlinden and I r- recorded Chit Chat Across the Pond 786. I'm sorry, 785, the one right before this one. And we did that because we are now officially announcing the launch of the beta version of xkpasswd.net, along with the uh, GitHub work that you can do and the help that we need in order to get this thing started. And it's a wonderful episode where Helma explains basically how she kind of went around behind Bart's back and did most of the work to get it started. (laughs) Which I'm very grateful for. (laughs) Right, right. Not in a bad way. Extremely grateful. In an open sourcey way, right? No, yes, and even better than that, because in the open sourcey way, there was no reason for Helma to ever do me the courtesy of checking with me what I would like and talking through the details. But Helma chose of her own volition to do that and then to actually, like, you know, do do what I said would be nice, which is <laughs> extremely kind of her. And in open source land, there's no reason she couldn't have forked it and done whatever she wanted. Right, she right. She was extremely kind. It's uh, it's amazing. So it's actually technically working. And uh, shortly, there will be a URL people can go to. Don't know how soon that's going to be. Depending on how wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey things are, one way, depending on when this episode gets published and your episode gets published, sometime in the very near future, uh, beta.xkpasswd.net will host this new code. And because my server is being shut down in three days, actually, my server is being shut down in three days, so this is happening soon. Um, The WW website is going to redirect to the beta, um, but I'm keeping it branded as beta so that people understand that the features they love are not gone. They're just not in between phases. (laughs) Yes, they are. They're on holiday. They'll be back, but they're on holiday. Yeah. So as of right now, technically, you can press a button and generate some passwords, but it's the generic preset. You can't set up your own presets. You can't choose from any other presets. There's very little you can do beyond that, but you can press a button and get long, strong, memorable passwords that you can actually type. And you can choose how many. Yes, you could choose how many. So uh, anyway, we want you to listen to the episode. It's Chit Chat Across the Pond 785. And uh, Helma and I had a great time chatting and going through the process of how she got there. And I tried to do it as a little more generic than, uh, I'm sorry, a little more non programmy We tried to keep it as a high level as we can, but it might stretch the definition of the word light a little bit. <laughs> but then again, we had an <laughs> astrophysicist on to talk about her Nobel Prizes under the light topic. So... <laughs> Yeah, uh, Nocilla Castaways, we're made of strong stuff. We, our light is quite strong. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. We quote that. So with that's enough further ado. We should, uh, we should get stuck in on the work that we're going to do here today. Indeed. So we are on our JQ journey, and I had promised you last time that we would spend this episode learning about all the different cool functions that JQ has for transforming data. So we learned how to build strings using interpolation, how to build arrays using the square bracket syntax, how to build uh, dictionaries using the curly bracket syntax. And I, we learned how to do some, you know, basically the idea is that we could transform the data into different shapes. And then we sort of, we, we got a look at some functions like L trimster and or trimster and stuff like that. But I said, there's loads and loads and loads of functions. And then we spent the next installment talking all about the functions. And then I realized that I was not doing things in the right order. So I've changed my mind. We are going to learn how to use JQ as a true programming language today, because I am so many shades of fed up of putting all of my JQ code on one big line I can't read. I would like to break it into separate files where we can put things on separate lines and not tie ourselves into knots. So this episode is dedicated to saving all of our sanity by using JQ as a true scripting language instead of just as one big string. Oh, that sounds wonderful, because it is a little hard to read. (laughs) All right, and the more we're doing, so if I were to introduce you to all the cool functions, your one long string would get even worse. Oh, okay. So I figured before I make your one long string worse, how's about we stop doing it as one long string? So uh, that is the plan for today. 
And uh, we also have a challenge solution. And I believe that you had a very productive time of the challenge. I had so much fun with this one. I spent a lot of time, uh, and by a lot of time, I, an embarrassing amount of time for probably uh, compared to everybody else, but I spent um, probably six or eight hours almost getting to the the conclusion of the first challenge, uh, the primary challenge, but I didn't quite get there. And so Bart said, you know, after I hadn't given up or anything, but Bart said, hey, you want to have a play date where we uh, do a little buddy programming? And I said, sure, that'd be that'd be fun. And he got me over the hump of the piece that I didn't get on the main part. But I was so excited by that about that that I kept going and I succeeded on the extra credit as well. You did. And not only did you succeed, because you did share your solution before we recorded, and you did it better than I did. Your solution is better than the sample in the show notes. Um, They're and, all, if they can both be right, Bart. <laughs> absolutely. They are both correct. And I always say there's an infinite number of correct answers, but yours has the advantage of being shorter, clearer, and easier to read. And I uh, like pretty code. <laughs> so your code is prettier and I like that. Okay. Uh, okay. I did, I did get a, a little assist from uh, GitHub Copilot was part of it, where I was asking it some questions. And this is, again, where I want to give uh, AI a, a, a thumbs up, is that I don't, I seem to have trouble with remembering terminology, but I can ask it questions without knowing the terminology. Yeah, I can say, okay, what's that thing in JQ, you know, where you got an array and you need to look inside it? What is that called again? You're going to like open it or whatever to go, oh, I got you. Yeah, we're going to explode the array and it'll do it for, it. it'll show me the syntax. You know, that's a silly example, yeah. but that's the kind of thing I can do. And so I was asking it questions about like, how do I, how do I say, I want to, I want to only get the, ele the, the elements of the, or the, the dictionaries that have uh, laureates who have surnames. Like, if it doesn't have a surname, I don't want you to have it. And, it. and it came up with a piece of code that I ended up being able to use. Excellent. And oh, I do like that Microsoft called it Copilot to make it very clear that this is not a tool to replace the human. This is a tool to assist the human. And if, as long as you use enough words that are going to show up in the correct answers, the fact that it's really good at language matching means it is going to figure out the right part of the internet universe to go send you to. And it tells you where it found its answer. So even if it's wrong, you're still better off because you know where to go look. Yeah, and it actually was wrong. But the piece I, <laughs> I needed to learn was something interesting. So I got, it's like having a co-pilot co who's just about as good as me. At something, trainee. But, but it's better at remembering terminology, maybe. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, maybe the trainee co-pilot. But yeah, anyway, that's cool. And also you, you, you learn something independently that we are going to learn either this installment or next. I can't remember where it is in the show notes because I reorganized them all, so I don't remember... <laughs> what's in which show but you're you're ahead of the class on some things as well which you were able to learn independently and that is the whole point of this right because that's what real coders do in the real world we don't know everything we just know we just have enough experience to be able to look it up and to understand the answer when we find it and to be able to use it and the fact that you independently successfully used a very useful function is another reason your code is way shorter than mine because you're doing it Good. better. So what was the challenge? So we wanted to transform our Nobel Prizes data set, which I have many critiques of. <laughs> I think it's quite dirty data, even though it has all the facts in there. I don't like how they chose to do it. Um, and I would like you to transform it into a new JSON file called NobelPrizeList.json. Uh, that's basically a simplified version of the data, which is really very focused on just the list of who won and what they won. So it should have just four keys for each prize, the year, which prize it was, so was it medicine or physics, how many winners there were, and just the names of the winners as strings. So it's a much simpler data set than the data set they have, which tells you what share of the prize, who won, and all that kind of stuff. So to start building up the solution, um, the first thing that I figured to do was to filter our list of prizes down to just those that were actually won. Because a bunch of the prizes, they have entries in the original data set because they decided not to give them to people. And then there's an entry in the original data set that says why they decided not to give them to people. But I don't want those in the final list. So I started by exploding the prizes array and then sending that into a select 
where I verified that the laureate's key was of type array, making use of the type function to mm. determine the type of dot laureates. So where there were laureates, it would be array, and where there weren't, it would be undefined. But obviously only array, double equals array, so therefore only the prizes actually oh. awarded would make their way through. So w one thing that bothers me about this is that you have to study the structure of the stuff you don't want in order to figure out, like you looked at it and went, hey, I noticed that there's no array if there's no laureates. Like you have yes. to, you have to look for what you, the, the bad parts. I guess you, I guess it's normal though. You go through and you try to do a query and you go, Hey, what's this garbage? Oh, I don't want that garbage. What's different about it? How can I exclude it? Right. Because usually you'll stumble across the need to exclude it by trying to do something and ending up with errors saying, cannot index undefined or something like that. And you go, why is there an undefined here? And then, you know, you go, you do a select where dot laureates pipe type double equals undefined and you have a look at those Nobel Prizes and you go, oh, you're weird. I don't want you. And then, okay. you, you know, you write a rule to, to filter them out. It's, that's certainly okay. how I've ended up stumbling onto these oddities in the data set. You know, I get sense. an error and then I try to figure out why. Um, so the next thing then is to start assembling what we do want. So having removed the ones we don't care about, I then pipe it into a new filter where I start to build my dictionary. And the easy ones to build are the year, where we just basically say year colon. And then I take dot year and pipe it to the two number function because I want my years as numbers, not strings. I would like to be able to do math on them properly. Um, the pr Oh, you're on mute. You put that way uh, into parentheses, and that's a way of that doesn't change it programmatically in this case, right? It's your colon, in this case. and you did parentheses dot your pipe to number close parentheses just as a way to make it visually separate, so you could tell what you were doing. Yes, and also because I don't know the rules for which doesn't doesn't have higher precedence than bracket always. Okay, so yeah, you're yeah. right that in the case of comma comma would have won. But I get very confused sometimes, and sometimes my queries break and I just throw brackets around things. <laughs> I could go look up the order of precedence, but I'll just throw brackets around it to be really well, explicit. Well, it's like when you do a mul it. multiplication, right? Three plus two times five. Well, two times five is going to win, but if you put parentheses around it, then your brain can see it. Yes, that's, it that's a perfect example. Anything. You haven't... Yes, yes, exactly. You've just been clear about what's real. Um, the prize then is just me renaming the category. So prize colon dot category, that's easy. And the number of winners is just the laureates array piped to the length function. Mm -hmm. So that gets us three out of four straight away, no problemo. The last thing then is we need to build the array of winners, which is a little bit more complicated because A, we have to dive into the laureates array this time. And then we have to build their names because the laureates array does not contain their names as one piece of data. It contains a first name field and or, well, no, always, yeah, and or, not and or, and maybe also a surname mm -hmm. field. There's always right. a first name, but there isn't always a surname. So the easiest, as a way to get close to the final answer, we can say that the laureates array, or sorry, the winners array is going to be formed by wrapping inside square brackets to reassemble an array. The explosion of the laureates piped into the string interpolation backslash roundy bracket dot first name, close that one, space, backslash roundy bracket dot surname, close that one, close the string, close the array. And that will give us a lot of the right answer. So if we look at the prizes where only human beings won, that is in fact the right answer. So the 1903 physics prize has three winners, Henri Becquerel, Pierre Curie and Marie Curie, and they look perfect. But unfortunately, in 1904, the Peace Prize was awarded to the Institute of International Law Null. Wait, <laughs> no? Where's that null coming from? Well, that's our friend, sur or, sorry, surname, not being populated. And this is where your, your result and my results differed. So you checked whether or not the surname exists and then used the alternate operator to go and do a different thing. So in your case, on one side of your alternate operator, you were just doing what I just did there, first name followed by surname. And on the other side of the alternate operator, you were just taking the surname. Sorry, just taking the first name. Right, that was in the extra credit version. That was in the extra credit version. Because I, so I did use a, the 
the other method to get rid of it on the first uh, before going into the extra credit. Okay. Perfect. Which gives me an opportunity to say that the way I sort of guessed people would have a go based on what we've already done in the series is to use the alternate operator to say either stick on the surname or empty string, which is at least nicer than null. Oh, so now oh, I didn't get that. OK, so now we have Institute of International Law space because the space between first name and surname is still there. But that's better, better. So the last thing I did then for my simplest solution was to use the or trim str function we learned about for removing the quotation marks in an example in the previous installment to just pull that space off the end. And then I had a working solution to get us to International Institute of International Law. Okay. Well, and that's full marks. So, so I actually did half of each of those sort of in my solutions. In mine, I just took the, the original solution you had that didn't work, and I said, trim off space null. Yeah, that's actually cleverer. <laughs> that, that, that's, yeah. I, 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 was, I, I think I might have been looking. Teaching us about that, that putting an empty string in there. I was like, I wonder why he's telling us about that. I don't know where to use that information. I was looking for an excuse to use the alternate operator. Oh, okay. Well, so I did the uh, R trimster to get rid of space null in the first one, but in the second one, um, and that's where ChatGPT came in, was I found that there's a select parentheses has, and that means, so I was able to say select has, quote, surname. And then, uh, then I said, give it, uh, if, so in other words, if it has a surname, give me first name and surname. And then the uh, uh, alternate operator, wait, alternate? Alternate, yeah. Alternate operator, and then just give it first name if that's all it had. So Which I is sort perfect. of did half that's of actually each really of nice. And that is a really nice solution. So my way of getting to full credit, so what I said in order to get bonus credit, so this was already full credit, mm -hmm. uh, my way of getting bonus credit was to never add the space to then have to go and remove it. Hmm. And the reason your solution works is because of the power of the JQ only data type empty. So in JavaScript, things are a value or they are null. And because the JSON language has a concept of nullness, there is NULL is a keyword in JSON, and so null is supported in JQ. So JQ needed to have like an emptier version of empty or a more nothing version of nothing than null. <laughs> so JQ as a language invented a new data type called empty, which means genuinely absolutely nothing. Like totally absolute absence of anything in JQ is empty. And so the select function, when you look into the documentation, it says that it either returns the thing you gave it or empty. So what you were doing with your select was evaluating it down to either the value for the surname or empty. And you can actually make empty yourself. So there is a function in JQ named empty, which returns empty. No matter what you do with it, it always returns nothingness. So with the alternate operator, you can, instead of saying an empty string or whatever, you can just say, or empty. So slash slash empty oh. is something else you can do. And I love the documentation for the empty function. So this is the full documentation from the JQ official docs for the empty function. Empty returns no results. None at all. Not even null. It's useful on occasion. You'll know if you need it. Smiley. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Well, you, you referred to it in your, in your hint, but I couldn't tell. I thought empty was a, a verb. I thought we were going to be using it to empty something. And so I looked at that and I couldn't figure out how to use it. And I spent so much time, probably of the six hours I spent working on this before I talked to you, I probably spent four of it trying to figure out has no, or if, to show me the ones that aren't null. And what I should have been looking for was the ones that aren't empty. That is also true. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It turns out, I so, don't think you can search for is null. I don't think that's a thing. You, Maybe you could get it as a return serves, of a query. Like if it returns the query null, then... Well, and also you, the type function will tell you if something is null, because if you send something null into type, it will give you back the string N-U-L-L, which you could then do double equals against. 
I couldn't double equals off that dang null that saved my life. I'll show you the, I, I wrote down every command I wrote that didn't work. And uh, my notes are 358 lines long. So I tried with comments. It's a type function though. So you would say type yeah. double equals null, not null double equals null. Anyway, um, I tried type my approach. not equal to null and that didn't work. Select well, that laureate's well, dot surname type not e a pipe to type not equal to null and it didn't work. A possibly a bracketing issue potentially. Maybe the pipe was in, happening in the wrong place. Possibly. Um, so my approach to never having to take away the space was to use the fact that if you join an array, if it has two elements, it will put the space in, and if it has one element, it won't. So my approach was to make an array of the names. And to use the alternate operator to replace the surname with empty if there is no surname, which means that you either have a two element array or a one element array, which when you pipe them to join will give you first name space surname or first name. Oh, because <laughs> you also talked about the join thing. I was like, what is he joining? So that was so, how I ended up fixing it without using anything we hadn't mentioned before in the series. So you said that first name, that surname, slash, slash, empty. Oh, you put them right up against each other. No spaces there. Is that on purpose? Uh, it's inconsistency on my part. Both are oh, valid. Okay. I usually do space them. Okay. Uh, but slash, slash, empty. Okay. Dots are name or empty. So in other words, my array will either have one or two elements. So when I join it with a space, it, it, it will only put the space in if there's two elements. And it won't join anything if it doesn't find a surname. Right, because then it'll be a oh, one-element okay. array. Okay. So, it, you know, it, it is a solution. There are an infinity many of them. Yours is nicer than mine. But there we are. But I learned more learning yours. So that's good. That is true. And yeah, so, and everyone got to learn twice as much because they got both of ours. So there we go. Right, so moving on to today's topic then, we are going to start treating JQ as a true brew scripting or programming language. And so the first step in doing that is to, instead of saying JQ space a filter space some files to go read, we would like to say JQ go fetch that file over there which contains your filter and then apply it to that file over there. So the first step in this process is the minus minus from minus file flag, or it's much shorter and friendlier friend minus F, which says get your filter from a file. So JQ space minus F space some file name dot JQ space Nobel prizes dot JSON will apply the content of something dot JQ to Nobel prizes dot JSON. Okay, so the the blo the name dot jq that's after the uh, minus f flag is yes. a file that is just going to contain the query. It's going to contain the filter, which could be as long as you like, because okay. now it's now you're free to have giant big filters all in that nice file. Okay, so there's a couple of rules in what goes into that file. Now that you have the luxury of having a file instead of a single string, you can do things like add comments into your JQ code, which is very useful. And it uses the shell script style of comment. So once you get to an octothorpe symbol or a pound symbol or a hash symbol or that thing with the two lines and the other two lines, whatever we're calling it today, from there to the end of the line is a comment. So if you put them at the start of the line, the whole line is gone. You stick them at the end of the line, it's just that bit from the end is gone. So just like we've gotten used to in our shell scripting. So that's nice and easy. Oh, nice. So I like to add comments to the top of my files. So you'll notice uh, there is a file in the show notes called pbs160a-1.jq, which is actually my challenge solution for the homework just sitting in a file. So it's still all on one line, but it's just exactly the same string as in the sample solution, but in the file instead. And so when you run jq minus f pbs 160a-1.jq Nobel prizes.json, it gives you the same answer you would have got if you'd done the giant big whole thing from the sample solution. 
Okay. So the first thing I did to make take us to the next step was to add a comment at the top of that file. So there is a dash two version of the file, which is it prettier. So the first thing I did was add a comment at the top that says this JQ script refactors the Nobel Prize's data set as published by the Nobel Prize Committee into a simpler form. The input it would like is JSON as published by the Nobel Committee and the output will be simplified JSON. And so that's the structure I like to use for all of my .jq files. What do, what does this file expect to be given? And what is this file offering you out? So input and output. Um, and uh, yeah, there are other things that I put in comments which we will learn about later. The next thing then is code layout. Now that we have a separate file, can we have stuff on more than one line, please? So instead of it being this Whole giant point. big mess, yes. yeah. Can you break it any old yes, place you, you want? Yes, you can, because the way it works is the pipe and the comma separate your filters. So the pipe takes the output of one filter as the input to the next filter, and the comma says do this filter and also do this filter. So those two are effectively your end of statement. So it doesn't care if you put new line characters in. It doesn't care if you put lots of extra tabs and spaces in. So you can lay this out any which way you like, because it will know that one filter ends when you meet a comma or a pipe. And so it's perfectly happy. This then brings us to the question of, OK, so we have infinity possibilities. What should we do? <laughs> I checked the documentation to see if there was an official style guide, because in JavaScript, there's an official style guide. Um, and which is why you can have stuff like JS Lint or, or JE Lint, ES Lint, ES Lint. There ES we go. Lint. I, some amount of letters. <laughs> um, ES Lint can apply the rules because someone wrote the rules. So I thought maybe there's rules for JQ and therefore I can do exactly the right thing and we won't have a big argument about this. There are no rules. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I looked at the examples in the documentation and I noticed the pattern followed a bunch of similar languages. So there are a bunch of languages out there for querying large data sets. The, the, the term of art is data lakes. So when you have a giant big amount of data that's unstructured, it's often called a data lake. And so if you live in open source land, the app that does most of the data lake stuff is called Splunk. Cool name for an app that we go looking for stuff, you go Splunking around. And Splunk has a querying language called SPL, which uses pipes to separate the different parts of your query. If you live in Microsoft land, the language for exploring your data lakes is called KQL, the custo querying language. And I don't know why it's called KQL, but it is. And KQL also uses pipes. And both KQL and SPL always put pipes on their own new line. So when you have one oh. filter going into the next filter, they put the pipe at the start of the line and then you can see your filters one after the other. So, you, so I sort of think of it like a waterfall where one filter waterfalls into the next one. Well, they just start the next one on a new line with the pipe at the front of it to show you. And I'm the next thing. And I'm that the next thing. That seems kind of clean because like in, in Markdown, when you're uh, lining up uh, things in tables, it's a pipe. You know, it's just sort of a, a clean, this is a, a place to break. That that makes sense. I've been doing, yeah. I kind of played around with it just when I was trying to look at my code, <laughs> I see what the heck it was. And I was doing it after the pipe, but it looks better at the pipe. Like the pipe starts the new line. I, yeah, that seems to work best. And that's what the documentation tends to do. And like I say, that's what you tend to get in KQL and SPL. So that's what I'm used to. So with my work hat on, I live in both open source land and Microsoft land. So I actually speak fluent KQL and SPL, which apparently makes me quite unique. Most people pick one. I've just ended up doing both. Uh, and now I have JQ on top of it. So I'm just using the same style I'm using in KQL and SPL in my JQ. And thankfully, so does the documentation for JQ mostly. So my three rules that I'm going to follow for the show notes, and they are an invitation for others to do the same or feel free to do whatever you like because there are no rules. But my three rules, which are sort of guidelines, is all non-trivial filters, by which I mean, like, technically speaking, dot year pipe to number is two filters. I am not going to put that on two lines because that will not make things clearer. That will make things mm -hmm. less clear. So for anything where it's would where I want to break it up, I will break it up with the start of the filter starts a new line. If I am starting or ending a large array or a large dictionary, I will 
you put the opening square bracket or the opening curly bracket by itself, go onto a new line and tab in. And I will stay tabbed in until the end of that dictionary or array and then close it back out on a line by itself, like a code block. Now, that's not exactly what you did in the example. You did the pipe and then open squirrely bracket for a large dictionary. So it's not on its own line, but conceptually, that's, that's part of the pipe, right? Okay, so that's you have then inside the filter you are then doing. But if you look at the very, very, very top, so the very first line of the of the example is open square bracket. Yeah. Correct. Which is exactly doing it. I got so you, if you got take you. rule one and rule two, you end up with the hybrid situation you see on, pi on say, pipe, space, open curly. Okay. That's sort of joining together rules one and two. And I'm going to ask a question last... because there's a... Well, go ahead and finish and then I'll ask my question. Yeah. And so basically the filter separators I'm going to put at the start of my lines so that pipe, space, select, not leave the pipe on the line above it, you know, dot prizes, pipe, and then on new line select. I've just chosen to put my separators at the start. It's, right. as I say, they're, they're my three yeah. guidelines. So my question, there's a difference between what was in the zip file, and I can correct the zip file, um, and what's in the show notes. You've got oh. backslashes at the end of the lines in the text. Are those I just do. Leftover? They're a leftover... They are leftovers of something else that the documentation okay. says would work, but doesn't actually work in real life. And so okay. I meant to take them out. I could take them out. Looks like we're both okay, taking sorry. them out. <laughs> yeah, which will be fine because Git will say us that we've done the same edit and we can complain. Right. So uh, they're not in the zip file. So then that's fine. Precisely. Okay. As a little bonus extra. So now that I'm putting my K my um, JQ code in a separate file, I'm obviously going to be viewing that file in a code editor, which in my case, and I think your case, we have both settled on VS Code as the editor we love, which is an open mm -hmm. source editor by, of all people, Microsoft. And they named it after a product that used to charge two arms, two legs, and a house. VS really? Code used to be stupendously expensive, closed source poop. And now they took the name and applied it to an amazing open source project. It's free Microsoft. We, no, we take the name. We'll take the name, you know. I like so it. So it's a I completely like it. different product. It has nothing to do with the old VS Code. Uh, sorry, it used to be called Visual Studio, and this is Visual Studio Code. That's the difference. Anyway, oh, okay. it's an open source project. It's gorgeous. And it has a plugin architecture. Yeah. So there are JQ-related VS Code plugins. Oh. There are two I recommend. The first one is a simple syntax highlighter. It is the wonderfully named JQ Syntax Highlighting. So, oh, no. <laughs> You know, I've actually been writing my JQ just in COD editor, just as plain text files, and it would have been a lot easier doing it. In v I use VS Code for all my JavaScript and HTML and everything else. I would have done mm -hmm. it over there if I'd known this existed. Very cool. So there we go. That's the first one. The second one I have also installed because what it lets you do is type JQ into, I, I don't know how much you make use of VS Code's command palette, but if you hit shift command P on the Mac, you get like a, a terminal window for VS Code. Mm -hmm. It's where you can type commands to VS Code. And if you install the plugin VS Code dash JQ, you can type JQ commands into the VS Code terminally thing while you have JSON files open. So if you have a JSON file open, you can just hit that key code, type JQ, and then type oh. a filter, and it will show you the output of the filter in the output pane in VS Code. So you can use your JQ knowledge to search JSON files that you just have open. So you could be writing code in any language, and you just quickly want to check for something in a JSON file. You can just oh, type yeah. some JQ straight into VS Code, and it will know what you mean. So like you can search with regular expressions, you can now search with JQ if you install this plugin. So that's really cool. You know, I've so had that's the second trouble figuring out what to do with that uh, command palette. And that maybe that'll force me to try using it. I do know you can open a, yeah. a plain old regular terminal right at the uh, bottom. And that's kind of fun. That is very fun. You can have multiple of them and you can split them as well. Yeah, I got real confused so, when it started, <laughs> when I told it to do that. I didn't know that's what it was going to do. It's like, oh, no, there's too many of them. <laughs> Yeah, you can have a lot. So uh, I used to have a bash one and a ZSH one whenever I was checking the differences between bash and ZSH. I'd have them both oh, open wow. at the bottom of VS Code uh, so that I could check hurt. while I was writing those show notes. Yeah. So uh, yeah. one thing that I don't 
think you mentioned or I missed it is at the bottom okay. of at the end of both of your JQ files that you're using as the input here, it says pipe at JSON. Did you explain yes. that? So the I didn't really. So the challenge said that it needed to output the results as a one line JSON data structure. So in the format you would expect it to come from an API. So that's what the at, so it's the formatting string. So last time we did at CSV to format a CSV. So at yeah. JSON formats as JSON. So it's a JQ, it's a JQ filter that's formatted as JSON? Yes. And now I say formatted as JSON. So you will notice that the Nobel laureates file, when you open it in a plain text editor, is all on one line with no spacing. That is the most efficient way to send JSON data across the internet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So JQ by default gives it to you pretty. If you pipe it through the at JSON uh, formatter, you will get it in that compacted, efficient format, which is used to store and transmit JSON oh, okay. in okay. the real world. Uh-huh. Yeah, that so makes that's, sense. That's all that's doing. Yeah, yeah, now I recognize it. A bunch of glop I can't read because it's all on the same line. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Which is why we use visual code, stuff like VS Code to pretty print our JSON as well. Because if you right, open right. a JSON file in VS Code, you can ask it to format it sensibly for you. Oh, that's so another that reason is, to play with it. Okay. Yeah. So that is another, so that is the first thing we want to do with programming in JQ is to have our stuff in separate files. That is already powerful. The second programmer's trick I would like to bring you is debugging. So I always tell you to visually imagine the shape of the data that goes into one filter and then what you would like it to be like when it comes out of the next filter. And that will be the input to the filter after. And so in your mind, you're watching the data transform. Mm -hmm. But if your, if your assumption about how your filter works does not match reality, your <laughs> mental model is getting wronger and wronger and wronger yeah, as you is. go from filter to filter <laughs> to filter, right? So I have told you in the past to build them up slowly by deleting everything after the point in time in the filter and seeing what it looks like. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to put a probe into that point in the filter and oh, just see what you yeah. have. Yeah. So you're yeah, an engineer. So you're, you know, you remember those electrical probes you could stick on various bits of a circuit board to see what, what's going on right. there. Right. There exists a JQ function, which takes as its input anything. Its output is always identically the same as what you gave it as an input. But what it does is write whatever you gave it a standard error. So it makes no change to the data. It just outputs it to STD error. So okay. you can stick that filter anywhere in your chain and it will have no effect except to show you what the data looks like at that point in your chain. So it's a probe you stick into your query and That's it will appear really cool. on standard error as square bracket debug and then some sort of value close the square bracket. And if you send debug more than one thing, I think you'll get more than one thing here in the comma. So to see what's going on, let's say, for example, we, we're going back to our, uh, we're oh, messing mention, around with Mention Dr. real quick that Taming the Terminal covered this, if people oh, don't yes. remember. My apologies, because that's in my show notes. So I call this kind of a thing where you're messing around with standard input and standard error and all that. They're called streams on the terminal. And you can mess with the streams, which I call terminal plumbing. That is my own creation rather than official documentation. Okay. Uh, but Uses Taming the pipes. Terminal... Exactly. Taming the terminal 15 and 16 are called plumbing and crossing the streams. I may have been watching too much Ghostbusters. Um, and they are episodes 15 and 16, and they talk all about the existence of standard in, standard out, and standard error, and how you manipulate them. And so that is over on Taming the Terminal. So okay. we should say that the reason it's good that it's written to standard error is because JQ's normal output is on standard out. So your debugging isn't going to muck up your data. So if you're okay. writing some JQ to take one piece of JSON and turn it into another piece of JSON, it's coming from standard in to standard out, but your debug is on standard error. Now, by default, they're both on your terminal, but you could pipe standard out to a file or to another terminal command and standard error will still go to your screen. Or you oh, can pipe nice. standard error to a different file, your error file or whatever. 
So you can poke and prod without mucking up your output. So that's why it's nice that it's writing it to the other stream. They're not on the same stream. That's the important thing. You're going to remind us in using this debug tool how to go look at standard error, I hope. Well, by default, you're just going to see it, right? Because by, if you do nothing, standard error comes to standard comes to the terminal window. So by default, you're oh, okay. just going to see it. Oh, good. Which is nice. So we're going to play around with an old JQ example um, where we are going to look at the command we built in the previous installment to render the details of the Nobel Prize for a friend of the show and Nobel Prize winner and Dr. Andrea Ghez. So... The filter basically starts with all of the prizes, explodes the laureate's array, finds the one with the surname Gez, and then it builds a new string using string interpolation to basically say first name, surname, was awarded her prize for motivation. Uh, But I'm just going to stick a debug into the middle of the stream here. So after the select for dot surname double equals Gez, I'm just saying pipe debug pipe. So I just literally (coughs) stuck it into, you know... We would have piped straight to the next filter, which does the string interpolation. But instead, I'm just going to interject with a debug. And when we do that, we see debug, ID 990, first name, Andrea, surname, Gez, motivation for the discovery of supermassive, blah, 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 share four. So that is the content of Andrea's dictionary as it exists just before we do the string interpolation. So that tells us all the keys that are available and what their values are, which helps us to do the string interpolation more cleverly if we were to do it again. So I think it's actually, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. It's a dictionary, but it's put inside of an array called debug. Right, because that's the format debug uses. Yeah. Yes. So that shows you you've gotten into the right one. You're where you think you are. You haven't- And what the keys are called. Ah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Can you end it with so a then, debug? Oh, sure, you can put them anywhere. Okay. It, will, it, it will show you whatever is currently there. So you keep, just keep now, sliding you put that, it along. I could have used this last week, yeah. Bart. <laughs> I know, that's one of the reasons I, that's actually, our play date was when I decided to rearrange all of my plans. It's like, no, we need to, we need to move this forward. Okay, I like it. So... Because both standard out and standard error go through the terminal by default, the default output there shows us the debug followed by Andrea Gez was awarded her prize for the discovery of whatever, right? So it shows us the result of the JQ filters and the debug all together on the terminal because both standard out and standard error connect to the terminal. But if we redirect standard out to a file called, say, citation.txt, then what we will see is that the output on screen is only the debug statement and citation.txt contains only the output from the JQ. So they are on separate streams. So we, they don't have to be mixed, which is the key point. Right, right. So that is, you know, just highlighting the, the importance of the terminal e bit there. So there are lots of cool things you can do. So... Um, you know, it is great that we can just put debug with no arguments and it will show us the value of dot effectively. But we can actually do anything we like. We can pass the debug command an argument that is a string and it will print us out that string instead of the value of dot. So we can build our own debug messages, which can use string interpolation to include other useful things. And one of the most useful things is the function named keys, which when you give it a dictionary, gives you an array of all of the keys that exist in that dictionary. So we can say debug open bracket and then the string, we have the following keys colon, then backslash roundy bracket dot pipe keys close our roundy bracket and that will pipe the current value of whatever it is, you know, wherever we are in the chain to the keys function and stick all of that into our string. So now when you run the command, it will say, debug, we have the following keys, first name, ID, motivation, share, surname. A lot shorter to read. It's not filling it up with all of the English and stuff. It's only telling us the keys. So you can imagine if your dictionary was really complicated, which had like, maybe one of the keys had like an essay in it. You don't Mm -hmm. want it to show you the full dictionary, right? Just show me the keys, please. So the keys function is fantastically useful. Another one I like to do, Uh, particularly when I'm doing a lot of... Uh, Yeah. The the keys, as it gives it to us, 
looks like it's almost in string interpolation format. It's qu- it's backslash quote, first name backslash quote. Why does yeah. it look like that? Because that's how JQ decided to implement it. Okay. <laughs> what is the backslash? So the backslash is is uh, escaping. So the technically quotes. speaking, yeah. So technically speaking, it's debug and its value is a string. And that string contains an array of strings, so it's gone. So this is a valid string. We have the following keys, first name, surname, whatever. But because okay. it's a string that contains quotes, it's escaped them to make it a valid string. Oh, I see what you're saying. And then, well, this is back to why did this... Okay, yeah, good. No, I like it. Gotcha. Yeah. And actually, before I jump on to what I thought I was going to say next, I'm reminded that there is another function that the documentation mentions that I think is good to mention is that you sometimes you take one file and shove it into JQ, but you can take as many files as you like, right? Because JQ says my first argument is my filter, unless you're using minus F, in which case it's a file name. And then I can have a second argument is my first data file. My third argument is my second data file. I can have infinity many data files. So if you're working with multiple data files in a single JQ command, it might be nice to know which file the piece of data you're debugging is in, right? Am I looking at a piece of data from file number one or file number 50? Like, where is this piece of data that's causing me an error? Where is my problem, basically? (laughs) So there is a function called input underscore file name, which will tell you the name of the file JQ is currently processing. So if you include that in your debug statement, then you know where you are. So... As an example, there are two JSON files in the zip file, ip-bartb.json and ip-podfeet.json. We used them a few installments ago. They just contain a little bit of information about the IP addresses for bartb.ie and podfeet.com. And if we give both of those to the jq command, we can see what input underscore file name does. So my jq command is debug processing the file backslash input underscore file name close backslash comma ip is backslash dot ip address so basically it's a string interpolation that shows input file name and the value of the ip address key and the input to that jq command is ip dash star dot json so the terminal will expand that out to be both of those files now because i'm because I'm only interested in seeing the debug statement and I don't want my screen cluttered with the actual answer to the JQ, I am using terminal plumbing to send the standard out to dev null, which is the computer's black hole. So the only output we're going to see is the debug statements, which is just for our convenience here, because that's what we're interested in. And what you will see on debug is processing file ip bartbjson IP is 37139, blah, blah, blah. Processing file ip podv.json IP is 104.21.34. So it's successfully telling us which file we're currently working our way through, which could be very useful if you're working with a big folder of data. I can barely keep track of where my problems are in one file. <laughs> so if it's multiple files and if they're formatted, you know, one's f- formatted incorrectly or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you may have a piece of dirty data breaking everything. Being able to debug it out and see what, what, what are you? And where are you is very powerful. So the, you know, the um, input underscore file name is definitely very useful. So there are actually quite a few functions that are useful for exploring data structures. So I love using the length function in my debug statements, because if you give the length of something, then you shove it through a select to filter it down, and then you do the length again, you would hope that you have a reasonable difference. So if I know that there are about 50 valid things in my data set and I start off with 500 and then I have 500 left, it's like, oh, that select statement didn't work. (laughs) Whereas if if I'm down to 50, it's like, yay, that select statement is reasonable. That's what I hoped, you know, or there should be half of these or whatever. So just seeing that length before and after. When I was doing the the, uh, is not equal to null, then I, if, right. if it kept being the same number, it's like, well, I haven't found it yet. That's, I would know that it was still not, I mean, I knew it wasn't working, but I didn't know where it was working all the time. Yeah. So I, I do that a lot. Give me the length of the array, do something, give me the length of the array again, and then see if what I'm hoping to happen has happened. 
Another useful one, if you want to just sample a piece of data, so you might have a data set with 5,000 records. And if you debug the whole data set, you're lost. You're just in a sea of data. So the functions first and last take an array and give you the first or the last element, depending on which function you call. So if you have 500 laureates and you just want to see what a laureate looks like, just, you know, laureates pipe first. So didn't we learn that with, that we could do it with uh, zero and minus one? Or minus sure. or something? Was it minus one? Yeah. Minus one as an array index. You, you absolutely can do it with an array index, but sometimes it's nicer just to, to have something really Englishy. Yeah. You just have oh, yeah. debug first, debug last. Yeah. The other one is fil- is limit, which takes two arguments, which is a number of answers you want, a maximum number of answers, and a filter to go and make you some answers. Hmm. And so limit, so you could say limit five and then explode the array and then it will give you the first five elements of the array. But it could be limit five, do a select. And then you could see, okay, well, this select is only giving me things that look this shape. Right. right? You may not right, want a yeah. thousand of them, but you might want 10. Well, I would have liked that a lot in this as I started writing it out to a file because I couldn't see, uh, you know, just this sea of data coming out of the, the, uh, right, the exactly. multiplied one. That would have been nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, keys we've already mentioned and has, which is the one you found with the help of autopilot. So has and then takes as an argument a key name will return true if the dictionary does have that key or false if the dictionary doesn't have that key, which is very useful in select statements, but yeah. also in a debug statement. Because if you're saying, well, I'm pretty darn sure all of these things should have a citation or whatever, and then you just pipe it, you know, has whatever you're looking for. And if you see true, 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 false, true, 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 it's like, oh, my data set has a mess in it. Why, why is there a false in here? And then you can do a select where whatever equals, you know, is false or whatever and have a look at it. But just being able to see a sea of trues versus a sea of falses can be very useful. So it has key name I use a lot as well. Uh, A structure I will often do for myself, as I was saying, is to do a length before and after a select statement. Now, that does mean that I need to turn it into an array before and after because the length function expects to be handed a whole array. So if we say prizes pipe it to debug length, that tells us how many prizes there were to start with. We haven't exploded them yet, right? It's just dot prizes to length. Then we pipe it into another filter, which has open square bracket as its very first thing. Then inside that array, we explode. So dot and then explode it. We pipe the exploded content to select. And then we close our array again. So what we have now done is we have built a new array, which only contains the things that match the select. But it's a whole array. We haven't, we've exploded it, but contained the explosion. So we started (laughs) with an array and we've ended with an array. We don't have individual pieces. We actually have an array again, which is something we weren't able to do until the previous installment. And up until the last time when we learned about the square bracket syntax, once we exploded an array, there was never any way to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, (laughs) which meant we went out of our way to not explode things we needed to keep in one piece. Well, this is how you reassemble Humpty Dumpty. You just put it all in square brackets. So if we do that to debug length, explode, select, recollect, debug length, what you will see is that the amount of Nobel Prizes that happened before 1950, we go from 670 total Nobel Prizes to 245 that were before 1950. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very useful. Nice. As example. I say, if I'm, if I'm working with a big data set, I like to use... Um, First and last, just to see. First and last are useful because if you're dealing with edge conditions, if the first one is outside of what you wanted, that's actually going to be very obvious, right? So if you want stuff less than or equal to 2000 and the first one is 1999, it's like, oh, that's an edge problem. Or mm-hmm. if you wanted, you know, less than but not equal to 2000 and the, fir- the last one is 2000, well, that's an edge problem. So first and last are great for looking for edge cases, just to verify for yourself that you really are bounding things correctly. Like it should have been a less than um, or equal to, but you used a less than or something. Yeah. And um, also you can debug. Um, so if you have 
if the filter that you pass contains an and also operator, then the That's function the comma, runs right? the comma. Yeah, no, it's exactly the debug. Yeah, so you, it'll do it twice basically inside your debug, um, and we can use the limit to give us a bigger sample. So we can say debug limit five semicolon to separate our arguments and then explode the prizes, and then we will be debugging just five prizes. Okay, let me think. So what we, you were talking about the and also operator, the comma, but you didn't use a comma in that one. Uh, that yes, I did. One? Debug first, comma, last. So when I, in my example of using first and last, I actually use them together. So I say debug first, comma, last. Okay, and sorry. And then I show the output. That one was long. It was scrolled over. I did. I couldn't see it. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Got you. Yeah. And as I say, that gives us the bounds, right? The first and the last. Okay. That's good. And so we see those twice. Um, da, 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 da. When working with dictionaries, I like to use the keys function. So if you want to get the keys for the prize of the dictionary, we can say debug first pipe keys. Right, so we take our prizes array, we take the first one, and then give me the keys of it. Oh, so I they like often that go one together a lot. as well. That, I could have used that, that a telling. whole lot sooner. <laughs> right, that's this whole installment. It, I was thinking, gosh, we should we could have used this a whole lot sooner. Yeah, but but I wouldn't have known to care, right? Right. I wouldn't true. be as excited about true. this because I wouldn't have been going. Ah, I got to open it up again. Let me look up. You know, open the whole file and look through it and read it. And this is much better. Yeah. And as you've already discovered, we can use has to tell us whether or not something has a key, but a very powerful thing. So we've already met the all function, which will return true if all of its arguments evaluate to true. So you can use all in conjunction with has to make sure mm -hmm. that every dictionary has a laureate's array. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So instead of getting a whole list of true, false, true, false, true, false, it'll either be all true, right? Hopefully. Or if it's all false, you're like, oh, there's dirty data here. At least one of these data things in my data set is not like the others. I got some work <laughs> sing to it. do. Sing it, Bart. <laughs> one of these things <laughs> no. is not like the other. Not like the other one. <laughs> so at this stage, we're doing pretty well for ourselves. So we now have our JQ filter as multiple lines nicely laid out. So the more complicated it gets, we don't get lost. We have the ability to add a little probe into the various points in our ever more complicated JQ filter, right? Because they're growing here and they're not going to get smaller when we learn more. So we can lay them out so we don't confuse ourselves and we can probe them with debug. If you put it in a file, wouldn't it be great to be able to give it some arguments into the file? It's like, if I'm searching for Andrea Ghez's Nobel Prize, how different is the logic to find Marie Curie's Nobel Prize? It's identical logic, just somewhere in my query is going to be the string G-H-E-Z instead of C-U-R-I-E, or whatever way it's what you're Okay. So wouldn't it be great to be able to pass in some parameters into our JQ filters that are now nicely separated out as separate files? And the nice thing is you can. So this is going to be our first encounter with a much bigger topic we will come back to in a few installments, which is variables in JQ. So this is a use of variables in JQ. There are many other uses of variables in JQ, but JQ is an interesting language because the JQ documentation makes it very clear that unlike in other programming languages where the first thing you learn is variables and the most fundamental thing is variables, in JQ variables are considered an advanced feature and discouraged <laughs> unless you're doing something suitably advanced. And I'm going to quote you from the documentation because I have discovered something while writing these show notes. The documentation for specific functions is quite, I would say, not beginner friendly, is me being polite. <laughs> but the documentation explaining the philosophy of JQ is actually very good. So this is what the documentation tells you about JQ's approach to variables. 
Variables are an absolute necessity in most programming languages, but they're relegated to an advanced feature in JQ. In most wow. languages, variables are the only means of passing around data. If you calculate a value and you want to use it more than once, you'll need to store it in a variable. In JQ, all filters have, as, have an input and an output, so manual plumbing is not necessary to pass a value from one part of a program to the next. Many expressions, for instance A plus B, pass their input to two distinct sub-expressions. Here A and B are both passed the same input, so variables aren't usually necessary to use a value twice. Hmm. For instance, calculating the average of an array of numbers requires a few variables in most languages. At least one to hold the array, perhaps one for each element of the loop counter. In JQ, it's simply add slash length. Now add is a function that takes as its input an array and adds all the elements. Length is a function that takes as its input an array and tells you its length. <laughs> if you add all the elements and divide it by the length, you get an average. So it, that is the full JQ filter for averaging an array, add slash length. Wow. No variables, right? Absolutely no need for any sort of variables or loops. And that is, that is JQ, the JQ documentation on loops also says, don't use these most of the time. You won't need it. <laughs> Do you know who wrote this? This was the team that finally, after a year and a half of arguing together, <laughs> and there were two camps, or, you know, Sally wanted variables and, and Joe didn't. And they went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, uh, Joe was like, okay, fine. But we're going to make them feel stupid if they break down and use them. <laughs> make them feel lesser. If like you're, 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 not, you're not understanding the spiritual philo philosophy if you break down and use it. That means there's something you didn't understand. It's a sign well, of That's weakness. funny you say that because the closing sentence is definitely that sentiment. So there is generally a cleaner way to solve most problems in JQ than defining variables. In other words, if you're defining a variable, double check that you're not doing things the hard way, because you might well be doing things the hard way. Still, sometimes they do make things easier. <laughs> Fine. So, you can build variables in the body of your filter. But that's what the documentation just told us is usually not necessary. We're not going to do that yet. There is a way to do it. There's a whole operator for it. It's called the as operator. We will meet it in our very, very last JQ installment. I have saved it to the end in keeping with the spirit of the documentation. My, okay. The last installment will be called advanced JQ and we will cover variables in advanced JQ. But well, there is good, a we really won't, good... We won't grow to lean on them. Precisely. And I don't want people to because there's usually a better way. Add slash length. Right? Every time you're thinking I need a variable, think add slash length and go, well, maybe I don't. Um, but a really useful place for them is to take arguments from the JQ terminal command to pass a value to a JQ filter in the JQ language. And there are flags on the terminal that allow you to specify variable names and values that you can use in the filter. Hmm. So... I'm going to give you a practical example because that sounds like a word salad. Um, what I do also need to tell you is that inside JQ, so when you're in the JQ language, so inside your .jq text file, all variables, their names are prefixed with the dollar symbol. That's how JQ knows it's a variable. Function names are just bare names. Variables are dollar something. So it's always dollar. So it's not X, it's dollar X. And now I'm going to confuse you. <laughs> because in the terminal, the dollar symbol has meaning. So it would be very awkward if the JQ terminal command made you put the dollar in. Because then the terminal would think the dollar was meant for it, not, and they would just break everything. So the JQ terminal command does not use the dollar. But when the variable appears inside your JQ file, it will have its dollar. And it's a case of don't break things in the terminal to fix things in JQ. Do the right thing in both places. Okay. It does, it does, it, it's, it's confusing, but sensible. 
So there are actually four ways of passing arguments into the JQ, so from the JQ command into a .jq file, and we're going to intentionally ignore two of them. So there are flags called minus args and minus JSON args, and they will produce positional arguments that are called. And they're really awkward to get to because they don't go into your code as like $1 or something. They go into your code as $args in all caps, dot positional, open square bracket, their index. So the first positional arg appears in your code as $args dot positional, open square bracket, zero. The second one appears as $args dot positional, square bracket, one. That is horrible. So we are going to use named arguments for our own sanity. So we're going to do them using minus minus arg and minus minus arg json. And they're going to let us make a named variable. These guys are a little weird. We're used to, term or to terminal commands having options that have minus minus something space one value. This is minus minus something space one value space another value. The first value is the name, the second value is the value. So to pass an argument named x, you say minus minus arg space x space the value for x. Okay, uh, we're, we're getting real abstract here on what we're talking about. I know, about. We're, I, I'm, I am seconds away from pulling this in, but I got to tell, okay. tell you it and I, then I got to show I'm, you it. I'm so a little closer. Okay, keep going. You're a little closer. So... The two arguments are minus minus arg space name space a string value, which means it will appear in your JQ code as a string. So of type string. The other thing you can do is you can pass it in a data structure as JSON. So minus minus arg JSON space name space needs to be followed by some JSON. So if you want to pass an array, you would use minus minus arg JSON. Because that way you can specify an array or a dictionary, or whatever you'd like. So that's the difference in minus minus arg and minus minus arg json. So, what if we wanted to pass a variable named dessert with the value waffles? Because that's the kind of thing we do here. <laughs> so, we can say jq, now I'm using minus n to say don't wait for any input, right? So jq minus n, and then I'm going to give it minus minus arg, space dessert, space waffles. So whatever is in my filter, there will exist a variable named $dessert that will have the value waffles. I'm going to then make use of the fact that I now know about the debug function, and I'm going to debug the interpolated string I like backslash round bracket $dessert close round bracket. And that will debug out nicely I like waffles. So we didn't give JQ a file, and we didn't give it, all we gave it was arguments. There's nothing for it to be querying. Right, Where's I said no the, input. There yeah, I know. No in, the, there, I know you said that, but what is it? If, you, if you're using JQ, you, you're not querying a JSON file. You wouldn't I'm query. I'm just doing a debug to show you uh, nothing. I'm just doing a debug to show you the variable working. I tried to simplify it, and I think I've confused you <laughs> Good. by trying to make the example simple. Well, good. I just didn't know you could I use JQ to... with no input. But we've done that repeatedly. How did, when we were demoing the math, or did I reorganize that into next week? I may have reorganized it into next week. I don't remember the order of my own show notes anymore. Well, anyway, Do you know about anyway. the post operator? I uh, don't think so. I don't think but, you But do. it's possible. Remember, now we're working with my memory, so that's not a good test, Bart. <laughs> okay. okay. So anyway, so I, we're able to just not pass it JQ, we're not telling it to query anything. And we haven't written a yeah. filter. We have. So the no. first argument is the filter, debug, open round bracket, quote. That's the filter. So debug is a filter. Okay. Well, debug is a function, and this filter consists of a call to the function debug, if we're going to be really persnickety about it. <laughs> okay. All right. So this shows so us we're, we're able to use dollar dessert inside the JQ... But you Correct. use dessert when you're talking to terminal without a dollar. There we go. There are the two takeaways. We have made okay. a variable named dessert with the value waffles. On the terminal side, no dollar. On the JQ side, it has okay. a dollar. All right. So if we tried to... So minus minus arg always makes a string. 
So if I say minus minus arg n 42, and then I say dollar n is, and then backslash n, is it greater than 100? And then I do a string interpolation dollar n greater than 100, the output will be true. 42 is greater than 100. What? Because it's F, it's, it's the string 42. String. Precisely. It's and the string 42. numbers come after letters in alphabetical order. Is that right? No, four comes after one in alphabetic order. So the string ba comes after the string a, 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 a. The string 42 comes after the string 1000. Oh, okay. If you're comparing it to numbers. Okay. If you alphabetically compare numbers, 42 is earlier in the alphabet than 100. In the same way that A, 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 A. Then why did it come out true? Well, because 42 is after 100. So greater than, yes, it is. You just said it was before before 100 alphabetically. I, okay, I'm sorry. I am dyslexic. I made a mess of that. Anyway, or I the point heard it is backwards. it's a string comparison. Okay. It's I know you've taught us that before, but uh, it's, it still hurts my head. <laughs> right, alphabetically, it's the wrong way around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you shouldn't compare numbers alphabetically. That's why okay. I'm so cranky that the Nobel Prize people put the years in as, as strings instead right. of numbers. <laughs> well, we learned to number. <laughs> exactly. So how do we get numbers in as arguments? And the answer is we tell JQ that we should treat 4.2 as a piece of JSON, not as a string, by using minus minus arg JSON. Then 42 will go in as 42, which means is 42 greater than 100 becomes false, as it bloody well should. In your show notes, you say alphabetical... Alphabetically, quote, 42, unquote, sorts after, quote, 100, unquote. Should that second, that 100 be without quotes around it? Well, no, because it's doing a string comparison, so they're both strings. That's what's actually happening there. And, quote, 42, unquote, sorts after, quote, 100, unquote. Yes. 42 okay. as a string sorts after 100 as a string, even though numerically it's before. No, okay. I don't see why. C is after A. 42 is after 100. Okay. I have to think about why. I can't see it. Okay. I thought In I understood that one before. In your dictionary, does the three letter word bad come before or after the one letter word do are you saying sorry the two letter word do bad would be before do 100 is before 42 no but bad is before do because it starts with a b not a d not because of the number of characters 100 is before 42 100 is before 42 because it starts with a one even though it's got three digits that doesn't matter it starts with a one Oh, okay. Okay. There I saw it. Not that that was, but that wasn't interesting to anybody but me. Okay. All right. So now when we, uh, if you give it our JSON N42, you say our so JSON it allows it to be a number? Correct. So the, the variable named N is now coming in as the JSON42, which is the number 42. Because in JSON syntax, 42 is a number, not a string. So then when we do a new comparison, it is a numeric comparison. Now, one very last thing. What if you want to have a variable that you don't always want to have? So what if you want to be able to pass a variable sometimes? And you'll see why in the worked example. If you just try to do it, and you can't basically you try as you might you can't say if dollar my variable name is null it will just break if you if you ever 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 use a variable name and it doesn't exist it's happening at compile time it explodes your script 
So you can't have an optional variable name using the variable's full name. It's really annoying. I tried every which way from Sunday. It doesn't work. The only way to have optional variable names is to use the variable's long name. So when I make a variable named x, it appears as $x, which is nice and short. It also appears as $args dot named x. So $args dot named is a dictionary. Wait, space? No, dot x. Yeah, okay, dot, you dot didn't x. say so, dot. Okay, you didn't say the dot. Yeah, That's what I was sorry. looking for. Dollar args yeah, dot so name dollar, dot x. Exactly. So dollar arg dot names is a dictionary where all of your named arguments go. Oh, okay. And so dollar args is the variable which always exists. So then the question becomes, does or does it not have a particular key, which the has function will tell us. So an optional variable is going to be dollar args dot named dot name of key. So you can say has dollar args dot named and then your name of your key. So that does okay. allow you to have optional variables with just long syntax. But it works, and you can use the alternate operator to get a default value. So if you say $args.name.sumarg slash slash some default, that will always evaluate to either the argument the user passed or your default. And so then you can use optional variables inside your JQ. So I've now been very, very abstract. The whole thing I've been getting you to is searching for laureates by name. So let's write a JQ script that we can search not just for friends of the show, Andrea, Dr. Andrea Gez, but anyone's Nobel Prize. So we already have our code for searching for a particular person. So as a starting point, we have that code, which is in the file pbs160b-0, which search for Marie Curie in this case by saying, take the prizes, explode them, select where any of the laureates have either a first name or a surname that contains Curie. So we basically say first name, surname, stick them into one string and then check if it contains Curie. Does that make sense? Yes. So that code allows us to search for Curie. We can run that script. So we can say jq minus f pbs 160b0 nobelprizes.json. And that will tell us that Marie Curie won three prizes, 1935 and 1911 for physics and 1903 for chemistry. So let us replace the string Curie with our variable, which I'm going to name $search. So pbs160b-1 is identical to the other file, but the contains, instead of saying contains the string Curie, now says contains search. Dollar search. dollar search. So to use this, we would now say jq minus f pbs 160 b-1.jq minus arg search minus minus curie. Arg. Thank you. That is very important. So okay, it won't work otherwise. <laughs> minus minus arg space search space curie space Nobel Prizes dot Jason. Oh, so that no will now run our script. That search. Jeez, that's going to drive me crazy. I know. I know. I did warn you. (laughs) So that will find exactly the same answers. Yay! Now, what happens if we try to use our script with the search query with a lowercase c? We get no results. Boo! This gives me the opportunity to highlight a very important programming trick and to teach you a new function. (laughs) The function ASCII downcase will convert a string to lowercase. If you ASCII downcase both sides of a contains operator, then it will do a case insensitive search. Both sides of it. You have to pipe. Right. ASCII downcase pipe to your contains pipe to ASCII downcase. So ASCII downcase pipe to contains and inside the contains dollar search pipe ASCII downcase. Oh, you're saying you're, you're, you're ASCII downcasing the input and you're ASCII downcasing what you're searching. Bing, bing, bing. Okay. Much better said than I did. Okay. Yeah, so if you do, if you convert everything to lowercase and then do your contains, it will find it regardless of case, which you can prove to yourself by running the dash two version of the file and searching for Curie with a lowercase c, and it works. Okay. So we have successfully made a script that takes an argument named search... So we can search for any Nobel laureate once we have figured out how to search for one Nobel laureate. Which is an example of why you want our, why you want variables. <laughs> so, Sally your challenge right. now, 
Yes. Sally was right when Joe didn't want to have variables. (laughs) Exactly. So when you break your code out, you do want variables. So your optional challenge, should you choose to accept it, is to take my example of searching for Nobel laureates by name and make it a bit cleverer by optionally having a minimum year and a maximum year. And if they don't provide a minimum year, then it should be all prizes from the start until perhaps a maximum year. And if they don't provide a maximum year, it should be all prizes from either the minimum year or the beginning. So you should be able to find all of the Curies before 1911, or all of the Curies between 1901 and 1912, or right? So basically, a minimum and or a maximum year, both optional, but you always have to give it a search string. Okay. I think I understand that. (laughs) And actually, I've just realized I didn't make it... Okay, so actually, for full credit, you don't have to make them optional. For full credit, you just have to make it always work with search min and max. And for bonus credit, make min and max optional. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Oh, wait. So the... Isn't the first... Just don't do min and max. That would make them optional. No, no, sorry, I I misspoke. So the first, the actual challenge for full marks is just to make it work where there are always three arguments. So don't worry about making them optional. Just solve the problem of there will always be a search string and a minimum year and a maximum year and make it work that way. And then if you can, make it more flexible and make the last two optional. So for full credit, you don't have to do the, the difficult part of making them optional. I misspoke there. Okay. Got you. Whew, boy, this was a lot. <laughs> this was, but on the one hand, it's only three things. But it's three things that enable us to write arbitrarily complex JQ without killing ourselves, without driving ourselves insane. So we can now put our JQ in a separate file, lay it out however we like, stick in little probes to tell us what's going on where, and pass in arguments. There are the three things we've learned today, but they allow us to script with JQ. Okay, okay. Um, did, did you explain what the syntax should be for more than one variable? So minus minus arg space name of variable space value can be used as often as you like. You just do it again? Just minus minus Just do arg. it again. Just minus minus, okay. Yeah, it's weird. Sorry, I, no, I skipped saying it because I was going to say it's weird for two reasons and I told you one reason and then I carried on. So the first <laughs> okay. thing that makes it weird is that it's minus minus value value. Normally it's minus minus one thing, but in this case it's minus minus one thing minus, and then another thing. And also normally you have one minus F or one minus whatever, but here you can have as many minus minus args as you like, which is weird. So it, okay. it is weird. But yeah, that is a very strange way to do it. Okay. I think I understood all of this. Got a little stuck in the alphabetical order of numbers, but other than that, I think I pulled it off. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not technically JQ related. That is, that, 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 you know, the lexical sorting holds true in all programming languages and confuses all programmers forever. Uh, it is a fun way to make first year programmers and CS100s heads explode. So I think I finally got it. It's because the four comes after the one. It didn't have yeah. anything to do with how many of them it was. Okay. Yeah. It just looks so wrong. Your brain is just like, no, how, how, how? But it's because you're doing, a str- because you're treating them as letters, not as, as numbers. Great, or great. Lexically. Great. All right. right. That is going to do it for now. Uh, and then next time we're going to get to learn about all the cool functions, which is going to make our JQ filters even more powerful, where we get to do really fun stuff like deduplicating arrays and sorting arrays and lots of fun stuff that JQ can do. But that is all coming up next time. And until then, happy computing. If you learn as much from BART each week as I do, I'd like you to go over to lets-talk.ie And press one of the buttons over there to help support him. He does 98% of the work here. I'm just the stooge that listens to him and asks the dumb questions. If you go over to lets-talk.ie, you can support him on Patreon. You can donate via PayPal, or you can use one of his referral links. I really hope you'll go over and help him out. 
In the meantime, you can contact me at Podfeet or check out all of the shows we do over there over at podfeet.com. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.